and will be Zoom if sewing this month. Contact Ms. Shirley Agers if you wish to help make lap pads for sick and shut-in members, hospice and nursing home patients, and pediatric patches for hospitalized children. If you cannot meet to sew in person at St. Paul, you are welcome to pick up supplies and sew at home. You are also welcome to check out a sewing machine if you can sew two items each month. That will be a blessing as we have given out items we already made. We are not having sewing classes for adults at this time. Children's sewing class will begin Tuesday, June 18th from 10 to noon for six weeks for children ages seven and above. Children will learn to sew pillows for dialysis patients, bags for children, and other items. They will also sew something for themselves. See Sister Shirley Agers or Mrs. Rose Parkman to sign up for class. Remember, the St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church Choir is going to Liberty Hill Missionary Baptist Church today at 2 p.m. The band meets at 12.30, correct? Thank you. Thank you, beloved. Let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John 4 and 7. Thank you so much for the love that was shown to us during the passing of our loved one. We are grateful for the calls, text messages, food donations. Thank you so much. May God richly bless you, the family of the late Leroy Garland.
so many classes. I have to take four classes this summer. And my first class was a May semester. Um, it was only three weeks long. Um, it was very intense, but I finished the class with an A. So, you know, it's never too late to do it. You can do anything that you put your mind to. Um, pray about it, ask God to help you with it, and you know, it shall be done. All right, so I hope you all have an amazing week this week, and be blessed.
in Seattle, is that correct? California. California. Thank you for sharing. And maybe you would like to say something this morning. I know I put you on the spot. Uh, but I want, I want to thank you for not forgetting about your community. I thank you for not forgetting about us. And I went back there to tell him that I thank him for his contribution to humanity, to making this world a better place, to impact our lives. We are indebted to you, and may God bless you. Um, how can uh, people connect with you to watch your podcast, those kinds of things as you uh, host them, you do on a weekly. I should be. Yeah. So thank you all for being here. As we go into our worship service, remember that everyone should bring something to come uh, to participate in worship as we come. And so the choir is going to sing, and we ought to make one big choir yeah. as we come to sing and worship the Lord. Let's pray that the choir is going to lead us. Father, we thank you for giving us another day. You... You, you spared our lives. You saw fit to, to wake us up, to let us uh, embrace a day that we have never seen before. And once it, it passes into eternity, we can never relive it, God. But we have this moment, we have this opportunity to come together, to worship, to fellowship, only because of your mercy and your grace. Lord, we've been reminded again through the teaching of your word that we shouldn't make things about us. The Lord, that we are to honor you. So we thank you again for just letting us come. Lord, you You've been good to us. You, you're faithful, God. You blessed us beyond measure. And even when you restore blessings upon our lives, sometimes we fail to recognize the little things that you do for us. But this morning we pause to say thank you for everything. Thank you for the great things. Thank you for the small thing. Thank you for the moments that you give us. And we pray today that we'll bring glory and honor unto your name. Now, Lord, the grace that it took to get us up, thank you. The grace
grace that it takes to worship you. We thank you. Help us, God, as we go into this hour of worship. We yield to your sovereignty. We yield to your lordship. We ask you to reign supremely in this place. Bless every soul in this house. As we come today to minister your word, let your word find a lodging place in every heart. Let us receive the glory for what you do, God, because it's all about you. Without you, we can do nothing. So orchestrate every song today. Orchestrate every prayer today. Orchestrate the words that come.
hands from God. Oh, I do that. It's only a reminder that we can't do it to anything, anyone else but our help. Amen. God is the source of our help. Thank you, God. All oh, of it comes from the Lord. Thank him for another day. A scripture reading today will be taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 and 40. And I'll read these verses this morning. These are the passages from which uh, message will be taken. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 and 40. I'll read from the New King James Version. And just keep your finger there because we'll return to it a little later. The Bible said, Now it happened. As they went, he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Word of God for the people of God. We receive ministry again from our Lord. Tell me what have you done that your master's minion? Tell me what have you done for the Lord to Oh. Uh -huh. 
getting out of comfort zone. Man, I remember when I was afraid, I was trying to hide and scared and all that. But you're here. And I thank you. Thank you to all of you for giving back. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to be here. We thank you. Uh, well, but sometimes the little things we overlook, Lord, it, it means a lot to have ushers standing at the door and, and willing to serve people. And, and it's a blessing to have people who are willing to, uh, to give back in a worship service. These young men standing here today who are just walking to receive giving. People giving to the ministry, bless them as they carry out uh, this task this morning. Bless the givers as well as the gifts. We ask that you uh, receive these gifts from our hands and our hearts. Bless them that they be used for the uplift and the advance of your kingdom here upon this earth. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.
you are the light of the world. He lives in us. The light of his glory should shine through us, illuminating our lives. So that other people, they can look at us and ask us the reason for the hope that lies within us. He's the light. God bless you again this morning. I read Luke 10, verses 38 through 40, and I'll just read verse number 40 today, and when you, when you return home, you can read this story again in its entirety. I, I shared from this, I think, on the 17th of March, I believe. And so here we are at this place again today. Verse number 40, and Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. I want to use this subject as somewhat lengthy this morning. It simply is this, relieving the pressure from having so much to do. Relieving the pressure from having so much to do. All of us need to accept the fact that there will always be something to do. Because there is always something to do, many of us get stressed out. Because we seem to have more to do than we feel we can get done. Now, can I say having something to do is not bad. Amen. For, for I believe that when God created humankind that his original plan was for humankind to have something to do. You go back to Genesis chapter number two when God had created Adam, he gave him something to do. Genesis 2.15, the Bible says, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. Though God gave man something to do in the beginning, he never intended for him to get stressed out because of what he had to do. Now, I need to establish that God, he intended for humankind to have something to do. And so as it was with Adam, God never intended for us to get stressed out just because we have something to do. In other words, God does not want us to live stressful lives. You know, we, we get stressed because we feel that we always have something to do. But stress is not only created from the thought or even the reality that we always have something to do. We can become stressed out because we allow ourselves to become anxious. Dealing with anxiety, we worry about things and the more we worry, the more we stress. And can I say it again that God never intended for us to live stressful lives. If you go back to, to the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 25 through 27, listen to what he said. He said, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barn. Yet your heavenly Father, Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Verse 27 is a question that we need to answer. He asks, 
which of you by worrying can add one cubit to your stature? In other words, Jesus wants us to understand, he, he wants us to understand, first of all, that we should worry. Worry creates stress. Yes, yes. And one of the reasons he doesn't want us to worry is because in verse 27, he simply said, worrying won't change one thing. <laughs> you can't make yourself grow because you worry. If, if worrying can cause us to grow, to add one cubit to our stature, there'd be giants all over the world. He wants us to understand. He said, worrying doesn't change a thing. Worrying does not change anything. However, worrying can have an adverse effect on our lives. Worrying doesn't add anything to our lives. But worrying can certainly take away moments from our lives. Can, can you only imagine all of the precious moments that we've lost by worrying? We deprive ourselves of moments that we can't get back because we worry. We spend so much time in a place being stressed because where the Bible says it is vain to sit up late and to rise up early eating the bread of sorrow. Can I tell you again, worrying won't change anything. But worrying can have an impact on your life. Listen at the words of the Apostle Paul from Philippians 4 as he talks about anxiety or worry. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding with God, your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul wants us to understand that God, he, he doesn't want us to stress. I mean, why would he tell us not to worry or to be anxious if, if he intended for us to be stressed? But no, God, he is stalking here through the Apostle Paul, and he's saying that, that I want to relieve you of your anxiety. I want to relieve you of your stress. What Paul said, he said, don't be anxious, don't worry about anything. He said, through prayers and supplication with they give it, make your request known to God. In other words, the thing that you need, the thing In this, in this passage in Philippians chapter number 4, verses 6 and 7, he says that when we turn it over to him, he said that God, he will dispatch peace. And, and, and the word here in the text, God, it is a military term, which simply means that like a regiment, God says that I'll do some things to guard your mind and your heart. Can anybody say that when I turn it over to Jesus, he made everything all right? Sometimes Pray about something that you cannot change. God, he'll give you some peace. God doesn't want us to be stressed out. Yet it seems that there are so many people living stressful lives. And may, may I say again, a common source of stress is feeling overwhelmed because we always feel that we have something to do. Now let me tell you what this message will not do today. This, this message will not make what you have to do disappear. So we need to deal with some reality. Now I'm talking today about relieving the pressure from having so much to do. It's not going to cause what you have to deal with to disappear. Because when, if the Lord gives us another day tomorrow, guess what? Tomorrow's issues, they're still waiting. Amen. And, and when tomorrow come, comes, you still have to do what you need to do. But this message can help us relieve the pressure from having so much to do. Yeah. 
say that there are far too many people who are stressed out today because they seem to have so much to do. Minds are overloaded, bodies are fatigued, patience are thin, tolerance has waned, tempers flare, health has declined, people are edgy. Just, just because they're, they're stressed out. I mean, I mean we're just, we just on the edge all the time. I mean, you know people are on the edge, don't you? I mean, if you're going if you, if you to pull out your gun and shoot somebody because they're driving too slow, people are on the edge. When, when somebody speaks to you or you speak to somebody, you just snap them up like that. People are on the edge. People, people are edgy. It's like there's a nervous tension that's built up, that's waiting to be released, all because people are stressed out. And one of the causes of the stress is people feeling that they have too much to do. I wonder how many of us feel as if there's not enough time in the day to do everything we need to do or like to do. Sometimes you come to the end of the day and, and see that you still have some of the, you want God to live in that day. Well, maybe you don't, maybe I'm tired of this tale, but I'm ready for the come in. Because we have so much to do, it just doesn't seem as if there is enough time in the day. Do any of you feel that your plate is full because you have so much to do? Maybe some of you have graduated from a plate and now you got a clap. <laughs> Because there's so much, you're loaded down with things that you need to do. And they're not only things that you need to do, but things you would like to do. You have so much on your plate. Am I talking to anybody today? Because it's a reality check that all of us will have something to do. And sometimes it gets to be overwhelming when we look at everything we have to do. And it doesn't seem to be enough time in the day. As I stated, when you finish one chore, there's another chore waiting. Yeah. Yeah. You get one thing done only to discover there's something else that needs to be done. You mark one thing off your list only to add something on when you take the one thing off. Amen. You fix one thing and something else needs fixing. I mean, listen, listen. The laundry list, it goes on and on and there seems to be no end in sight. People are dealing with pressure. They seem as if they're ready to implode. Because they just can't handle it. You know, home ownership is a great thing. And, and I thank God for, for each person who desires to, to achieve home ownership and you, uh, you know, obtain that. But, but can I tell you this one thing about home ownership? As long as you got a house. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. As long as you have a house, you always have something to do. Yeah. Listen, you cut the grass and it grows back. Yeah. You, you, you go into your house, you stay in the deck, and then it fades. You paint the house and the paint just peels. You wash your clothes and they get dirty again. Yeah. You clean the house one day, only have to get up tomorrow and do the same thing all over again. It seems sometimes if we are on this merry-go-round of life and it never gets off. Yeah. Or you can't get off. You know, now, now some of y'all, now y'all know, some of y'all went to the fair when you were children and, and uh, you rode the merry-go-round and I was talking to someone, I think it was Derek, and not going to Carowind, but riding stuff. Uh-uh. If I go to Carowind, I'm riding the merry-go-round. <laughs> that, that other stuff, that's not for me. But, but when you go the merry-go-round, you see the same scenery over and over again. You're one of them horses that goes up, down, up, and down, and you can't get off until they stop it. Sometimes life is like 
like this, where, where it seems as if there's always something to do. This endless cycle can cause pressure yes. that we don't know how to deal with. And unless we relieve the pressure in a healthy way, we will succumb to the pressure. Pressure can drive people into places of isolation. Pressures can cause people to think unhealthy thoughts. Pressure can create a distorted picture of reality. Pressure can cause people to forge unhealthy alliances. Pressure can cause people to give up. Pressure can cause people to walk away from something that they should have stayed close to. Pressure can cause people to adopt unhealthy vices. Yeah. You see, and we must learn how to deal with the pressure. There are some people are in bad places not because they wanted to be there. They just couldn't handle the fact that there was so much to do. It drove them to a place where they adopted unhealthy vices. And before we began to look and think about all of the unhealthy vices that we as a church deem to be unhealthy, there are a lot of unhealthy vices that we pick up right in the church because we don't know how to deal with the pressures of life. Looking at Martha, we can learn how to deal with some of the stress or keep the stress from building up. As you read this story, you'll discover that Martha was stressed. And I believe Martha was stressed because one of the reasons is she felt that she had too much to do. As I said, I preached this message from this passage a few months ago in a message entitled Jesus Visits Martha's House. And here we again dealing with the same story. And Jesus had to come. He had come into town and he visited the home of Martha. Martha was distracted as the text said. And as I said, I believe she was distracted because, distracted because she felt she had so much to do. Now if you read these verses, the Bible doesn't say specifically what Martha was doing other than serving. Martha could have been cooking. She could have been cleaning. She could have been setting the table or whatever else she felt was necessary. The thing that is clear, Martha felt as if she had to do more than she could do without her sister's help. Three things I want to take away from this message that I feel can help us relieve the pressure from feeling or having so much to do. The first thing we can do to relieve the pressure from having so much to do is to solicit help from other people. Now notice, and I think I made this point before, Martha, she asked Jesus, make, make Mary help me. And there's no indication that she asked Mary herself, Mary, will you come and give me a hand. Don't you know that when we have more than we can do, we need to check our support system. We need to look around and see who can help us. And, and can I tell you, if you're drowning, don't drown if you can ask for help. You know, if there's someone who can help to alleviate some of the stress, the load, you ought to be, you don't have too much pride to ask people for help. And sometimes we feel that it is beneath us to ask people for help. We can be drowning if we want people to think that we got everything to, together and we don't need anybody, but all of us need someone sometimes. Yeah. You know, I, I said, my of y'all know I like my cartoon. And I've been that way since a child. I don't like this new stuff, but that old stuff, I love that old stuff. My brother used to get mad at me and say, we want to play football, and Bobby didn't want to watch Bugs Bunny. <laughs> you know, but I, I, I enjoyed some of the simple things in life. But, but even on the cartoon, when they were drowning, they, they would at least do this. Sometimes they'd be going down there and do. Then they do. Then they do. They say, you come help me. But what happened to us? We've gotten to a place where we feel like it is beneath us to ask other people for help. If you need help, ask someone, will you help me? Martha didn't ask Mary. Martha, Jesus, go make Mary help me. Now, I don't know if she had asked Mary on another case and Mary said, no, you do it. I don't know what might have been. 
bit. But when you need help, then ask for help. Now, I want to give a footnote here and listen to this carefully. I need to add this footnote to those who can help. The footnote is this. If you, you shouldn't have to wait for someone to ask you for help when you know they need help. I don't know who said say it again, but I'm going to say it again. <laughs> you know, and, and, and really, listen, it is good. Listen, if you have the ability to help someone and you see they need help, don't sit around and wait for them to ask for you to help. You need to jump in there and help them. I mean, John, John said, how can you have this world's good and shut up your bowels of compassion to those who have need, you can help them. And then you talk about the love of God is in me, how much I love for them. I mean, John teaches something that's wrong with that picture. If someone needs help for you, and you came from you, and you can help them, and you won't help them, he says, how can you talk about how much you love somebody? Yeah. Moses didn't ask Aaron or her to help him. When Joshua was battling against uh, Amalek, Exodus 17, verses 10 through 12, the Bible says, so, so Joshua did as Moses said to him, and he fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and her, they went up on the hilltop. And as it was so, when Moses held up his hand, the, the, the Israelites prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Mm. Verse 12, the Bible said, but Moses' hands became heavy. Mm. So they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and her supported his hand, one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. You know the story. You know the picture here. Moses tells Joshua, you go on out and you, you battle against Amalek and I'm going on the hilltop. And Moses got there. He was watching the battle. And every time Moses puts his hands up, the Israelites started to prevail. But you know, no matter who you are, no matter how much anointing on your life, every now and then you get tired. You see, God calls people to the work of ministry, but what he did not do, he didn't make them superhuman. In other words, no matter who you are, you need help sometimes. And Moses on the hill, he holding up his hands, and Israel were preventing his hands got tired, and Moses' hands started to fall down. Moses didn't have to ask Aaron and her for help, they saw that he needed help. So they took a stone and they put it on him. And then one got on one side. The other got on the other side. They held Moses' hand steady until the battle was fought and the victory was won. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, we need to join in with folk when they're working on the front line and we see that they're tired. They're doing what they can do. And they get weary on the journey. You ought to try to lift them up sometimes and help them so the battle I'm almost finished. The second thing we can do to relieve the pressure from having so much to do is prioritize. You see, we must come to a place where we realize what is most important. And then we need to accept the fact we can't do everything at once. Now, I, I think I heard this somewhere where they said that if everything is important, Nothing is important. If everything has the same, if everything that we feel is important, if we give it the same degree of importance, what is really important? We, we, we need to learn how to prioritize. We all have so much to do, but everything can't be done at the same time. Each thing does not have the same degree of importance. We, we got to learn how to take some things off of our plates. Amen. Is it really important? Is it really important for me to do this at this time? And sometimes we understand that if we don't learn how to take some
some things off our plates and create balance, it's going to cause us to get this feeling of being overwhelmed. You know, when I counsel people at times, I use this illustration. I ask them, I said, uh, uh, do you like pie? And most people say, yeah. <laughs> I ask them, what's your favorite pie? And they may tell me, I say, okay. If you love to eat apple pie, for an example, if you sit down and eat the whole pie at one time, what's going to happen? <laughs> Somebody say, blow up. <laughs> You're going to blow up, you'll get sick. You understand. You understand where I'm going with this. No matter how much you love the pie, you can't sit and eat the whole pie at one time. you got to cut it up in slices. you got to take one slice at a time. If you eat a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, before you know you would eat the pie, but you won't make yourself sick trying to eat the whole pie at one time. Sometimes you've got to prioritize, take some things off your plate, and do a little bit at a time. You can't do everything in one day. When, when we look back at the creation, God didn't create everything in one day. Amen. And, and why, why do we think we got to try to do everything in one day? We give the, the same degree of importance to everything like everything has to be done in one. We got to learn how to prioritize. Can I tell you today, and I'm almost finished, can I tell you to keep the balance in life? Yeah. Nothing is wrong with keeping balance. You know, and, I, and I've discovered, it took me a long time to learn this, how important balance is. You know, Jesus gave us an example of keeping the balance. And I want you to listen to me. I want to read, read this from, from Luke chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. The Bible says, however the report went around concerning him all the more. Jesus had worked a miracle. Now, I think Jesus told me, I don't tell nobody what the man told me. He just, he just couldn't, he couldn't, couldn't keep it. You know, when the Lord does something good for you, sometimes you just want to tell it. The man went around and told him. And so, and so the Bible said, when the report went out, uh, uh, people heard about it, and a great multitude came together to hear him and to be healed of him of their infirmity. Verse 16, so he himself often withdrew mm. into the wilderness and prayed. Mm. Can, can, can I just break that down and help us to understand Jesus performed these miracles. Mm -hmm. But yet, he left the crowd mm -hmm. to go away to pray. Were there other people who needed to be healed? Yes. Were, were there other people who needed help? Yes. Were there were there people who were just waiting to say, if I could just get over there to Jesus, I need something from him? Yes. These people had all of these needs, but then Jesus, instead of staying with the crowd all the time, Jesus slipped away. Yes. Now that's important. Yes. You know why I believe Jesus did that? I believe Jesus did it for himself. Amen. Amen. Not being selfish. But Jesus understood the importance of keeping balance in life. Sometimes you got to do some things for yourself. Now, now the Sunday school lesson was a beautiful lesson, and, and, and we were taught not, not to be conceited or not to be self-absorbed or self-centered, where we simply think about ourselves all the time. But I need to tell you, even at that, you got to learn how to keep balance in life. Sometimes you got to spend some quiet time, or can I say, some me time. Amen. Amen. Anybody here that needs some me time? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to ask somebody to raise their hand. Thank you, my sister. You raised your hand. You know, I want to wave my hand. <laughs> you know, because I'm learning how to keep the balance of life. You know, I enjoy the simple things in life now. And I get up early in the morning. One time I get up all day to go and pray and, and, and sometimes to read the word of God. But when the sun comes up, my wife might find me outside. I'm just walking around. 
around in nature because I need to just get out of that quiet place and enjoy what I see and enjoy God. Sometimes you got to get yourself some me time. You got to slip away from the crowd. Jesus knew that all of this work still needed to be done, but Jesus got away so that he could pray. Sometimes you got to do something to soul into your own life. You got to build your own spirit, man. You got to find a place where you can have some peace and quietness because when you come back, it still will be something to do. Okay. Here's the last point I want to make. Last point I want to make. Thank you, choir, for going with me this evening. You know, y'all wish I had a lovely morning. <laughs> but in a few more hours, we'll get another message. And it won't be this message, but I tell you, I thank God for giving me something to do. I told the Lord, Lord, if you inspire a word, I don't, know, I don't care what you send me. If you inspire the word, I'm going to preach. The only time I don't want to go preach is when I don't have a word. But when God gives me a word, I'm ready to preach. And I'm ready to go over there now because God has given me a word. And I thank you for coming with me today. And everything that I said concerning balance, that is important. But let me give you this final point. The final thing we need to do to relieve pressure from having so much to do is to make room in our lives for the Lord. Can, can I tell you, you can never, you should never get too busy for the Lord. And let me say that again, we need to hit it. You should never get too busy for the Lord. When Martha had received Jesus in her house, Martha was busy. Martha didn't take time to receive the word of God. Listen, one of the greatest mistakes that we can make in our lives is when we fail to make time for the Lord. I don't care how busy I am, I got to have some room in my life for the Lord. Because it had not been for him, I wouldn't have got up this morning. God gave him the curse of God before he up and started me on another day's journey. God, he took time for me every time I look at the blessings. I know that I didn't bless myself. All of my help, it comes from the Lord. And since God is so good to me, the least I can do is give God some time. The least I can do is to tell him thank you. The least I
The Bible says godliness with contentment is a great gain. I may not have what everybody else has.
Lord, we thank you, God, for reminding us of your Lordship is never ending, God. You are the chief cornerstone, and we bless you, God, because we know you. God, we thank you for being able to meet with you through prayer, God, and being able to hear from you through prayer, God, knowing that you will respond. God, I'm reminded today, God, that I can't be too busy to connect with you in prayer, a privilege that we have as the children of God. Lord, we thank you, God, that even though we go through storms, hurdles, journeys, hills, and valleys, you are there, no matter which era that we are in. I thank you, God, Lord, that no valley is too deep enough for you to be there with us and get us out. God, I thank you, God, that there's no hurdle too, too tumultuous enough, God, that you won't get us through it. God, I thank you, God, that even in the midst of the storm and all the attacks and the enemy of spiritual forces of evil, God, we have a fighter on our behalf. We thank you, God, that we are born and conquerors through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Heavenly Father, God, that we have the power source, which is Jesus, on our side. God, we thank you that you put your super to our natural, God, your extra to our ordinary, God, and you make everything all right. God, we thank you, God, that we have power because we are connected to you, God. Lord, we thank you that even when our, our strength goes low, God, you are our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength, God. We can pull through some things with the prayer and the weapons of our praise and our worship and our time committed unto you. God, we thank you right now that when things become too much, God, we know, God, that your, your burdens are light, God. We know that you told us to cast our cares on you because you care for us, God. There's room at the altar for the people to come. God, I thank you that the loans that we came in here with, God, is a safe space to drop it in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for my brother, my sister that came heavy, didn't know where the drop sign was, but God is here right now. As the people stand at the altar, men, women, boys, girls, I thank you that you hear every silent cry. You hear every silent struggle, God. And I thank you right now, God, that they don't have to be silent anymore because you see them in the name of God. Hallelujah. You see them, you hear them, you're able to respond. You're able to shift it. You're the game changer, God. I thank you right now, God, that the people who came to help it will see the light in the name of Jesus. The people that came confused shall have sanity in the name of God. The people that came struggling, and God, and broken shall be healed. Hallelujah, God. You are able to put the fragments together of our life, God. We thank you, God, that you are the one that makes the difference in our life when we thought it was over, God. Hallelujah. You are the one, God, who are here. You show up every day, God, because you're already in the day, God. I thank you that you're already in tomorrow. But before we even get there, we thank you for the moment today. I have breath in my body. I can speak on my own. I walked up here, God. I thank you for the movement of my body. Somebody don't have legs somewhere, but I thank you, God. Hallelujah, God. I pray for the people that are trying to put on a good face, but they're struggling. They're trying to appear strong, God. But even the strong have some time. They need to sit down called on the strong person of all, which is you, God. God, we don't have to put on any facade, any shade, any blindness. God, we are free to be ourselves with you. And God, as we uncover ourselves, and God, as we just uh, uh, make ourselves available to you, God, we ask you to fill our cup. Fill our cup, oh God, we're running low. Some of us are actually empty, God. We need something, God, to keep us going. I thank you for the person that pressed their way today, God. You are here. My brother, my sister, wherever you are, God heard you, God see you. It's all right in the name of God. There's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing too big for God. There's nothing too strenuous for God because he's already there. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He does not change, and he's all-powerful. God, I thank you. I thank you, God, that you are the way that, that, that we can get out of some hard times when we didn't see any light. There was darkness everywhere, but you were reminded, God. We are reminded you are the rose of Sharon, God. I thank you. Hallelujah, God. You are the battle axe, God. Hallelujah, Lord. You are the prince of peace, God. You are a strong tower, God. I know who you are. You are Jehovah Jireh, God. You are a deliverer, God. You are everything we need you to be. And right now, somebody needs you to be strong. God, right now, somebody needs you to be a healer, God, in the name of Jesus. Somebody needs to be a better person, God, because they're struggling with warfare, being attacked every day, but don't even understand that it's warfare. It's spiritual warfare, God. Help us to recognize the enemy is at work, God. He want to take us out. But because you are there, God, and you saved us through your son, our children are covered in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Thank you. Our children are covered in the name of Jesus. Bless you. Thank you, God. Our adults are covered. Our seniors are covered in the name of Jesus, God. God, I thank you. You see all, you know all, you care 
Amen. 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 